again and welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And as Dan would say, this is the month shall, that shall remain nameless. Shall it? Are we in a leap year? No. No, no but it should just remain na- We should never talk about this month. We should. It's my birthday <laughs> month. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's just like as soon as the weather, because it never fails. Uh, it's always the month that you're like, why? Why do we have the Why? Well, not only that, and I think I've mentioned this before, but, you know, as an immigrant, in South Africa, it's summer so, in February. So your so birthday was during the summer. So it's so pool in- parties and, you know, <laughs> like that whole thing. And that's sort of what I associate oh, my, my birthday with. And now it's just <coughs> bleak yeah. and gray. If and you survive, all of those I always things. figure this. If you can just get through the next four weeks, we're good. Yes. But you know what? Like everything <coughs> in life, I hate the this tickle. too shall pass. It will. Yes. So, uh, but just so stay warm good. out there. Um, Oh my God, it is <clears throat> Watch cold. the ice because that's, it's even weirder that like Wednesday is supposed to be 40. So then what happens is it melts and then it freezes and then we have more ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have, mm. uh, we have the new monster in our home. So we have an extra puppy. Uh, so that's been an adjustment, just mm. sort of figuring out, uh, that, but we took her and Nellie out on a trail, uh, probably on Sunday, mm. right? It snowed yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. So on Sunday, you know, off trail in the woods with that beautiful quiet and yeah. just the pretty snow. Uh, and I think we exhausted her for exactly 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> puppies, puppies are funny how much energy they have. It's amazing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I could tell that it's going to be good for us, too. It's a little rough on, on Schmelly. You know, yeah. she's Nellie Schmelly. She's 15, uh, going on 16. So that's a lot, you know, because Puppy wants to play. And, and Nellie's kind of like, like oh, man, dude, can I just, like, <laughs> mellow out and lie here? So... So there's a bit of that, but it's it's it's, it's pretty cool. Nice. Uh, we had one big poop storm uh, in the house that oh was boy. not equally fun, but now we just are leaving the door open, yep. so our house is freezing. <laughs> I mean, it's a doggy door. Right, but it's still cold. When it's cold, it's cold. You know, when it was like minus one the other morning. But I am training her yep. to go fetch my... Paper. Nice, nice. So I don't know if that's going to work out, but so far I, she'll run, she'll pick it about, up, she'll, she's doing it. I don't remember what I was thinking about the other day, but I was like, I really want to teach Jenny to go get something. Dan's, I noticed teaching her or trying to see if she knows where to find me. Oh. Like, go find Tammy. Yeah. Just to see, like, does she understand that? Right. So that's interesting. But I would, there was something I was thinking about, and I'm like, can I just teach Jenny to go get that for me? That would be kind of I mean, I kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm turning into uh, my own cliche of what uh, What, someone uh, in the 50s was all about, right? Enjoying life with all the things. You read the paper, you drink the coffee, you have the dog, you just do the things. Yeah, but also, like, I, I, when, you know, because I had such an amour childhood, uh, you know, once we bought the house... I think I just had this like sense of, whew. and Louie had asked me, well, what do you want to sort of be like, you're a grown up now, you know? And I was like, I want to get my newspaper <laughs> delivered to the house, which is, I mean, I'm probably the only person. No, I do. You know, On Sundays only though, because it's too much paper. Physically to throw is here, but I have uh, two front page stories hmm. that I think we should okay. talk about. And I know you want to no, talk no, about bill fine. reform too, but the first one is mm. there is a bill um, that Amanda mm. Bolden Who's introduced. Who's a state rep from Manchester. She is uh, from Ward 5. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, I used to work with her on a lot of projects. I loved what she was doing with Shire Sharing. Yep. She would do this private charity once a year for Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was wonderful. Uh, there was a bit of a falling out. She, I think just, you know, with the Democrats, she just went full. Full on Democrat. You know, lockstep, <laughs> vote one way, yep. don't think for yourself. So she introduced a bill that would allow teenagers over the age of 16 to get vaccinated without parental consent. Mm. And to be honest, you know, I was 16 when I started law school. I was living (laughs) on my own in an apartment. I was never legally an emancipated minor, but I was pretty much an emancipated minor from the time I was 10. Right, right. And so, um, so something about that appeals to me. But that being said, whatever number we pick, we need to be pick one number and say that's the number for adulthood. Right. Because basically what we've done is every time the government creates an exception, mm-hmm. they grow. 
Yep. Because now someone has to monitor, okay, alcohol's 21, to die for your country's 18, to get jabbed and possibly get myocarditis, 16. suggested 16, then there's this, then there's that, then we're trying minors for as adults in certain situations and all of it. And it doesn't make sense. The way it worked under common law was from zero to seven, you're not compass mantis, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're a, a, a little child and you really just can't make decisions for yourself. That's why we had guardians. From seven to 13, you were like <laughs> marginally compass mantis, but for the most part really shouldn't be making any <laughs> decisions. Then from 13 to 18, you, you become an adult. I don't know where this 16 comes from. What, what, what age, well, like where well, are you in and, high school then? And it, 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 uh, I was gonna look it up, but I know that distracts you, so I'm gonna try not to. But interestingly enough, I think um, in the last week or so, there was a bill that this, they voted on in session right. about whether or not to raise the age to marry should go from 17 to 18. Because what happens now is you might have a 17 year old who, you know, you, that's almost a, that's almost the age. So what do you do when there's a a girl and it doesn't limit it? I'm, making a presumption. There's a girl and her, her boyfriend is in, going off into the military and they want to get married beforehand. Or there's a 17 year old who's pregnant and the boy, they're going to get married and they're going to, you know, like there's circumstances with parents consent and everybody's consent. Now, parent, it, nothing about it would say that you could marry off your 17 year old like child slave, which is what they try to make it. But I will almost bet money that Amanda Bolden voted to say you had to be 18 to get married, but you can be 16 to do this. Probably, but here's the question, right? Like we are debating sort of as a nation and as a people, uh, what the role of parents in the state are. Now, sadly, statists seem to believe that children belong to the state. I have in fact seen several videos in the past mm. week or two mm -hmm. of crazy state statists going on television Same. and saying things like uh, the the government, the children belong to the government. I forget if it, it was, may have been a Canadian was, lady or no, it was no, it? Timberlane, no, no, it was Timberlane, uh, the president of the teachers union from Timberlane so, School who said if the parent, basically they would be, teachers should just be able to do their jobs without interference from parents or the law. Or the law. The law. And I was like, oh, okay, oh. That, that, that seems interesting. And to be honest, I mean, I'm not thrilled about everyone trying to control speech by no. writing these different laws, yep, right? Yep. Like that just is in the same way that every time we create an uh, yep. age exception, we're creating problems. Every time we create an exception, this is my new yep. rule of thumb. No more exceptions. There should be very few rules and we should all follow those rules and we should all know what it is. So this really does not make sense to me. And I would like to ask this to folks back home who maybe don't agree. So let's say your kid goes and gets vaccinated. They're 16. Mm -hmm. They decide to go with maybe their older their, friends or, or just, you know, something. Their buddies right? at school because, you know. and and. Your child is the one, so now you haven't consented, mm -hmm. and your child is one of the children, and there's sadly a lot of this happening, although it's not really reported on, who is somehow harmed yep. by one of these vaccines. The vaccine makers, for the most part, are uh, not cannot be held liable, yep. which means the government is the insurer of last resort. The government has paid out less than, I think it's 0.2%, but let's say under 1% of all vaccine harm claims ever filed. So good luck with that. So the question becomes if the the, the so so if we pass this, the kid gets vaccinated, there's some kind of harm, the parents haven't consented, who's, who's gonna pay for this? Well, the parents are, their parents' insurance is gonna that's the thing. I had the same argument when um, they were talking about parental notification for abortion, not parental consent, parental notification, because what do you do if your 14 year old daughter has an abortion that you don't even know about? She has a medical procedure, an invasive medical procedure that could have medical repercussions afterwards and mom and dad don't even get to know, you know, like that was a little crazy. Same thing here. I don't really know if the language of this bill says that um, 
that the parents even have to be notified, do they? Because no. So, I, I, so Johnny goes so, with so his buddies. So it says HB 1126 states, a minor 16 years of age or older may voluntarily consent to be vaccinated against any communicable disease for which a vaccination has been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration. So does this mean so approved, that, yeah. approved or emergency well, but even authorized? Still, or, um, you know, so I know Moderna and Pfizer. Well, Pfizer is approved for 16 and older. Moderna is 18. 18 and older. Um, but this so. is all vaccines, which means they could go for the HPV. There's all sorts of, there's things, you know, like, and if you're not an adult, then you're still a child and you're still. I mean, I'm just like, let's pick a lane. Remember right? the good old days where it was 18 and everyone could do anything after they were 18? That seemed like a sensible world. It seemed like we had rules we could all follow and we had a sense yeah. of what the hell was going nothing on. But, you know. in, nothing in this bill says that the parents aren't even notified. It just says a minor 16 years of age or older may voluntarily consent to be vaccinated against any communicable disease for which a vaccination has been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration and a licensed health care provider may provide such vaccination without the consent of the minor's parent or legal guardian. So are you even allowed to get a tattoo? Like you how old do you it. have to be to you get a tattoo? You can't use a tanning booth. Yeah, you can't okay. even use a there, tanning booth there with go. your parents' permission uh -huh. until you're 18. All right. But you can, you know, so, be injected with things. So that was that was number one above the fold today. But here's the one I really yeah, want to talk is... about. So so there is that statement about schadenfreude, right? Which is you feel guilty because you take pleasure out of someone else's misery. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna admit straight up that's what it is. Yep. Anyone who's been watching this show for a while knows that you know Nicole Klein Knight, who is a state rep in in the city of Manchester, and I. That's there her she right there. Is. That's um, her and house session. Official official capacity as a legislator representing the constituents of Ward Four, right there. So, um, so she, she and I, you know, have have we poll stand at the same time sometimes. So we've had interactions over the years, and some of you may recall that one of them was I had suggested that you know one of the things we could do if we're concerned about uh, kids not getting their meals during COVID, as I said, why don't we start a program that gives everyone eggs, butter, and a frying pan, and let's teach them right. If you teach yep. a man to fish, yep. He eats forever, right, right? Right. So so with that same sort of logic, and she actually straight up to me, I mean, this is the most elitist thing I've ever heard someone say, was like, no, these people are too dumb to learn how to fry an egg. I mean, I was shocked. I'm shocked now. I hope you're shocked at home. Well, and More she, shocked. Yes. <laughs> and now she's been outed. So House Dem leaders call to punish one of their own. Manchester lawmaker accused of repeatedly using a racial slur. We'll leave it at that it was the N word yep. and that it was in, uh, I, I guess they were uh, arguing between a, 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 a black a, community a young activist. Black, yeah, and, a young black activist. And she was, I don't even know what the scenario was, but you know. But it sounded like she hadn't actually directed it at. No. Uh, so, so the move came after a group of liberal advocates issued a stinging condemnation of state rep Nicole Klein Knight, accusing her of re repeatedly using the N word, referring to a black community organizer who testified at a pl public hearing on January 21st. Quote, despite not using that hateful word at this young man directly, uh, rep Klein Knight crossed the line in aggressively using a word with such a horrible history to intimidate a black constituent. The letter said from a dozen leaders uh, from from the black indigenous people of color community. Um, so, so, so here's what I, I mean, I'm gonna preface, I, I'm getting a little enjoyment out of it, I'll be honest, you know, I know, I'll just be that one, one step closer to the bad place. Uh, <laughs> so, First of all, this is what's our, the irony of this. Let's do that. So you've got people on the left who are outraged by use, the use of a word. Reality is, is words are just words. Words are not violence. Oh. Words are just words. Um, you know, sticks and stones break your bones, but words will never hurt me type thing. We've gotten so far away oh, from that that just people get are highly that. offended. Yeah. Um, so there is that little bit of irony. The, the, the part that gets me about her is... This is twofold. Um, as we had shown in that picture, you know, she's a little off. You know, that was what she chose to wear the first time they returned to house session. Um, 
Then she came another time with the umbrella. She had the clear umbrella because that was going to protect her from COVID. Um, she has, um, she was on Zoom when they were doing the Zoom committee meetings. And she apparently has a prescription for medical marijuana, which I have no problem with. But she's sitting there on the thing eating gum. You know, like that's, that's antagonistic. That's not like, oh, I have to take my medicine over here. She's just... She, that's what she does. Now, if I'm not mistaken, she was one of the leaders of the progressive caucus up in the state house. That's what they were asked for her to be removed from. From what I understand, she has been removed from the <laughs> criminal justice committee as well um, by the house leader at the request of the, the Democrat minority leaders. But um, so she is just always on the go, but you have to wonder, <laughs> like if this is what the, the leadership of this progressive movement looks like, You've got, you've had numerous Democrats leave the Democrat caucus in the state house, which is highly unusual. I mean, there's multiple, three or four, I think there's three I or four say now, over the last couple exactly of weeks. Exactly what yeah. they keep saying is because some of the leadership, like Rep Klein Knight, is just over the top. It's just too much. They're either controlling and demanding that everybody toe the line exactly the way they want, or they're just supporting things that even their own party doesn't support. So, you know, I, I was thinking about it this morning. So we talk a lot um, about this sort of victimhood oh. culture that we've yes. created, Everybody's right? Everybody's a victim. Um, it's, it's a part of neo-Marxism. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, instead of just saying everyone comes to the table as an equal, which is actually the world these people claim to be trying to create while also indoctrinating yes. people on the opposite of that by saying that everything is a power structure. Someone always has more power. And somebody's like, always you out. Know how somebody's you, always out to get you. And someone, you know, so you're you're either a victim or a um, aggressor. Uh, aggressor, right? But part of me was like, no one's been really talking that I've seen at least about this sort of savior complex that I think a lot of mm. people suffer from. I mean, we talk about it in the sense of elitism. I did just use that word. And I think, you know, if the shoe fits, um, don't let it be a glass slipper. Uh, the, the, I think there's this notion, I think on top of people's brains kind of getting <laughs> broken through the propaganda and through, you know, all, all, all the past two years, which I frankly think was low grade warfare mm. like i actually think that into uh, from from a mind perspective people have actually been harmed yeah. by by what the government did the government's response to the pandemic not the pandemic right. let's be clear right and so i think some of these people who subscribe to this victim model mm -hmm. right so victimhood model also, I think, suffer from a savior complex. Mm -hmm. And so you, you start to think that you, everything you do is right and noble yeah. and all of it. And really, you need to stop and check yourself, you know? I was in a, I don't know why I did this, Tammy. It was not because a smart move. it's winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, right? So Huffington Post this morning posted a story of Rachel Maddow, mm -hmm. who is stepping down from MSNBC mm -hmm. or whatever she, okay, she's whatever. on, right? Uh, for a while. And I just said, good, maybe she'll have some time to read some counter arguments against medical tyranny and authoritarianism. She needs help. That was a mistake because I did not factor in HuffPo audience plus Rachel Maddow fans <laughs> equals sadomasochism for Carla. Right, right. So, you know, people just went nuts. I had to actually switch off the yeah, notifications. Like, you just call like this. You know what? I'm done reading but, these. But, but when people were attacking me, they were like, you don't understand. She just deals in facts. She's the smartest woman on TV, blah, blah, blah. And then someone actually posted the clip of her talking about... I mean, the entire clip is inaccurate with regard to how these vaccines work. Uh, I actually wonder if that's why they are giving her a break, right, because, because that can't... clip is just showing up right. everywhere because she sounds like a insane right. person who is, I mean, she was on television and she made those statements, much like, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci has done and all these people. We have the clips that we can stick mm -hmm. together now. And I'm like, why aren't all these people being deplatformed, right, right. right? So I think someone like Rachel actually also suffers under that. Right, that, she can't, um, it's this. Savior mentality of, 
But I, I have to be the one to tell you that this is the way to go. And look at me. I'm, you know, right. I'm and, the all-knowing Rachel Maddow. And so I think we're going to see a tipping point that is going to go back to mind your own business. Yeah. And let's come up with some basic rules just we being, can all agree right? to. Can we all because... just agree to be nice and pleasant and not yell at each other and sticks and stones will break my bones with words. Yeah. Never, but, type stuff. And, yeah, and, yeah. and really, as you said, that whole notion of, of uh, words are violence, that is the yeah. Stupidest um, thing that we let slide. I do have to laugh when you said talking about deplatforming. I do have to another little. Sorry, just enjoying it. I had to laugh if you haven't. Um, I listened to Joe Rogan's podcast. So we we listened to him before right before it was a thing right. So I just had to laugh that Spotify. You know, here Joe Rogan's on Spotify. Joe Rogan ma made a deal with Spotify, and Spotify benefits and Joe Rogan benefits. Come on, like this is how deals are made. And then, um, God, I can't even think of his name now. Uh, Neil Young. Neil Young. I had, I did have Neil Young in my head, but it was come. Didn't and sound Joni right. Mitchell. Right, but Neil Young says you either get rid of Joe Rogan or pull my music. And Spotify went, okay, no more Neil Young music. And now, and what's funny is the people who are so upset that Joe Rogan's doing so well, which he was doing. Joe Rogan probably had more followers than anybody before COVID even started. Right. But the I the irony that the people who are like, oh my God, look at this, are just driving more people to listen to Joe Rogan because they go, well, isn't he the UFC guy? And I don't know, right. I, don't, I don't like UFC. And um, and then they go, oh, but I listened to that one show and that was really good. I think I'll listen to him again. And I'm like, oh, you people. You well, don't that, is, that is good because I think that means we're starting to get to the tipping point, right? Like I think people can only take so much cognitive dissonance. Yep. What do we mean by that? It's literally where your 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 brain and your values and like the world around you doesn't make sense anymore. It's kind of like if someone has to uh, blackmail you and give you constant, constant propaganda to convince you there's a pandemic when right. your 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 reality around you tells you. I mean, I'm sorry for the folks who spent all their time at home, but those of us who are just out and about for the past two and a half years. We're just like, yeah, we don't know. Like the entire Florida is just going, what are the rest of you doing? And New Hampshire too, yep, for the most yep. part, right? So so once you, you get to that stage where you're just like, man, my reality, my, my visceral physical reality and yep. the story I'm being told in my head just do not nope. match anymore. People have to start to go, okay, either enough, this is nonsense, or start to look for answers. What is the answer? You are the answer for yourself. Yep. That is the point, right? Sort of coming back to that sort of like, what do I want? Right. What are my needs? And who's, responsible, about... and who's responsible for me? I'm responsible for to me. me. And You're not responsible for me. No, you know. The government and... is definitely not, not responsible, responsible for me. I'm responsible for me. What decisions I make are mine. So here, I, I'm coming up with a new theory. So, so my theory about the social contract is people have it totally wrong. Like we've somehow framed the social contract that it's like uh, the, the state society has an obligation to help the individual. And I'm like, no, I think that's backwards. I think the social contract to the extent there is one is you as an individual have a duty to take care of yourself. Yes. Yep. That is your social contract. Yep. So if your life is a mess, if you're unhealthy, if you're unhealthy, you if you can't health. hold a job, if you can't, you know, you if, if you're if you if you drink or take drugs to the point that you can't function. earn enough money to be able to pay for a roof over your own head, but somehow always have money for right. cigarettes, right? And you know, you and look, I'm ground. not judging anyone to the extent that like I used to smoke, yeah. I used to drink, I used to do drugs. Right. You know, like all of it is a thing, but then you make a choice But you still to have to say. be, right, you still and have always, to. always, I was a very high functioning yeah. boozer. <laughs> I will say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I do want to interject um, something before, it is, I reform. agree. Yep. I just want to mention this bill number. Um, there's House Bill 1476. I believe there's a, a committee hearing on Friday, this Friday. Um, this is a bail reform bill that was put in by uh, Manchester State Rep. Ross Berry. Um, it was co-sponsored by, um, since passed, um, Barbara Shaw, and also with Mark McLean, who's also a Manchester State Rep. Um, it is not a perfect bail reform bill, in my opinion, but it does help. Um, basically, the problem we have is we changed the law, and we've, we've kind of said that if you can't... Um, if you they can't keep you in jail without offering you bail, 
Like, which is reasonable. There has to, there's a three day window to say, okay. And then we did add to the law that, you know, if your, if your financial situation is the only reason you're in jail, that you shouldn't be in jail. Cause I agree with that. If you're just poor and you just got in trouble this one time, but the rest of the things, if you're out on bail already for something else and you commit another crime, if you're a repeat offender, if you've skipped court hearings, all those different things, those people should not be just getting Being out released. of jail with no bail. Yep. They, they need to be kept because they're irresponsible. Back to that personal responsibility. Right. So HB 1476 is a good step towards helping it. Uh, it's a big, big, big problem in Manchester and I'm sure in other cities. Um, you can go out and you you can Google um, New Hampshire General Court and click on um, the bill, and I believe you can submit your whether you support or against it um, right there online. I know if you look, uh, I think it's Manchester News and Views has a link to it so that you can do it. Um. And you know, with this bail stuff, the important part here is I think you know we became overly sympathetic to people's things because we on the one hand we're like the war on drugs sucks and we're taking people who are just making personal choices yeah. you know if you're just smoking pot at home yeah. at night you know no big if you're the guy downstairs who's like on meth and attacking our reporters right. on Elm Street right. that's, that's a, a problem right. so where the dividing line should be is if you commit a property crime or something where there is a actual physical victim, not the state, but a, a right. property you crime into against somebody, the person right. you or you person. steal something, then you know what? You're a dirtbag and you should spend, so you're a criminal and, if you, and you, you should you need spend to get, some time in jail. Right. And if you're in jail awaiting trial, you should have to make a case to the court as to why you shouldn't have to be in jail awaiting trial. Now, if, if you're a first time mm -hmm. offender, that, that's different. A repeat offender? I mean, we have instances in Manchester where somebody's assaulted and they get arrested and they, they put them in jail and then they let them out and then they assault somebody else and the they put them in jail day. and they yes. let them out. And, and it that just is keeps not, going and that is, that not, is not what it's supposed to be. So this is a good uh, good first step at least. I think it could be better, but and, it's better And than again, I will just recommend uh, San Francisco, uh, yep. Michael Schellenberger's book. He talks about a lot of these things and how... Uh, these progressive laws and these kinds of programs where we're just letting people out and letting it slide do not help us. And so we need to really take a look and come up with a good solution. And I think hinging it yep. on property rights. And if there's a victim, that's a different bowl of wax. Yep. And uh, if you live in Manchester Ward 9 or just in Manchester in general and want to see some improvement on the board of mayor and aldermen, uh, Victoria Sullivan is running for Barbershaw's seat, um, yes. Ward 9 alderman. You can get information at Victoria for Manchester. That's F-O-R spelled out, victoriaformanchester.com. Um, Donate some money to her, sign up to help, whatever I can do. We need to get some and more good voices. In March. That is on March 15th. And I think we're probably just out of time. Um, stay warm in this month that shall not be named. And <laughs> Carla's we, birthday month shall be named. <laughs> and we will see you next week. Have a great week. Bye, guys. Bye.